Welcome to episode number 15 of Tradecraft Security Weekly. Uh, I'm your host, Bo Bullock, and on this week's episode, I'm going to be talking to you with Mike Felch about identifying weak session tokens using Entropy. Now, um, I'm sure if you've ever used Burp Suite before, you've probably seen the at least the tab that says Sequencer, and you might either have wondered what that is, or if you've used it before, you might still not really understand what exactly is happening whenever you find that a session token has low or high entropy. Um, so we're going to try to help, uh, you know, define a little bit more what the problems are with weak uh, session tokens based off of the entropy that's being uh, used to generate them. So um, I'm going to let Mike take it away and we're going to talk about uh, some entropy here. Cool. So before we get started with entropy, let's kind of define what session tokens are. Um, this might be a, a, a new primer for some. Most people will probably be... Um, review. Yeah. In right. Review. So, um, so session tokens are unique identifiers mm -hmm. that a web server uses um, and is issuing to a user that's authenticated. So user logs into a web server, the web server needs to keep some sort of active session with that user. And so the way that they do that um, is generate some sort of unique identifier for that user that they could you know, maintain. Um, so they always know who's logged in and, and or where user's at or whatever the functionality that they're using the token for. And so they don't have to type their password in for every page they visit. <laughs> right, that would be uh, a bad website. Yeah. Uh, horrible user experience. Um, so usually these tokens are set um, kind of when they first log in, right? So you go to a form, you put your credentials in, you send them to the server. Um, hopefully that's when the server sets that session ID for you. Um, there have been times that um, the session token can be generated kind of before the user logs in, um, but that kind of creates other kind of problems that we'll, we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, and then also hopefully those session identifiers do expire because you can imagine like logging into a website and then leaving it open for so long and then never logging out right. that lingers in the background and actually creates a, a, a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we're going to look at is kind of how these sessions are hijacked. So a lot of times if the tokens aren't kept safe, um, an attacker can, can come in with some sort of attack and then, um, and then leverage those session tokens. Um, and then the last thing that we want to really focus on is that if, if you're building a web application, you want to make sure that those session IDs are randomized well and that they're long. Um, the shorter it is, the more trouble it is, and the less random um, obviously creates a, a problem. Mm -hmm. So looking at some of these session attacks that are that are traditional, like the cross-site scripting, right? So a lot of times if I could execute JavaScript in the, the browser, there's ways that I could steal session tokens if um, if, this, if the session header is doesn't have the proper um, flags on the cookie. Um, there's uh, cross-site request forgeries that can create problems. Um, some of these are well-known. They're mm -hmm. talked about. They're always usually in the, the OWASP top 10. Right. Um, session fixation is an interesting one because session fixation don't I don't think it gets enough airtime. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times, if I could if I could execute JavaScript in your browser, I can get you to set um, your own um, token, token prior to even logging in. Prior to logging in, or I could I could um, I can go to a website, generate my session ID. As long as it doesn't um, authenticate, if, as long as it's generating that session ID before I log in, I could mm -hmm. I could trick you with that session ID potentially if it's passed in a URL to get it to set um, kind of within um, within your and, session. And then me as the attacker or you as the attacker, you know that session ID. You can go reuse that as right. me now. Yeah, we just wait for you to log in. Right. Once you log in, give it some time, and then I just try to use that mm -hmm. session ID that I've I've I fed you. Um, and then sometimes that works as well. Mm -hmm. Then you have your traditional man in the middle, right? So if it's over an unsecure session, if I'm sitting well positioned in within a network, I could I could either um, you know capture your token that's being passed. If right. it's in the URL, I could capture it from that perspective. Just your traditional man in the middle attacks. Um, but what we're going to focus on today is kind of session brute forcing, and that's it's really um, just an interesting attack that I don't definitely doesn't get enough light. Um, and to be clear, we're not talking about like brute forcing like passwords. Yes, this is not brute forcing credentials. It's actually brute forcing the session ID that was generated for you. Right. Now, sometimes it's hard to kind of target you specifically, mm -hmm. um, but you know, if we could brute force a session, we can gain access to the application um, authenticated as a user that's right. there. And so, kind of focusing on, on on that and drilling in a little bit more on on um, brute forcing of the sessions is entropy and this this word is so um interesting it's it's calculating using statistics um the the predictability or the quality of the randomness that was used to generate that session id 
Um, sometimes session IDs can be generated or session tokens can be generated in lots of different ways. Sometimes um, you'll see if they've rolled their own session management that um, they'll use user profile information, maybe their user ID or... In the actual session token. In the session token, yeah. Or they'll use like the date and time. Which is something um, that's not random. Not all. random, no. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's predictable, right? right? So if I know like relatively when you logged mm. in or if I know you know your user ID or your email address or the flag, if if I can log into a session and, and see how my session was generated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Chris Eng did a, a talk a long time ago, uh, like 10 years ago, I think it was, where he was generating user IDs with like all A's to see if that username was in any of the session cookie information, right? So if you, you can imagine if I could predict my username and have a bunch of A's or B's or C's and see where um, the uniqueness is, you'll see that it becomes less and less um, predictable. Just kind of an interesting... Um, interesting approach to it um, also sometimes these can be based on poor randomness like if they're using like if their key space they're using to generate the randomness is like all capital letters mm -hmm. a through z right. or um, zero through nine mm -hmm. you can see yeah you can have a really long one but if the, the uniqueness of the character set is low that becomes low randomness um, and so as long as we can take some steps to discover some of that poor entropy um, we can we can move forward with kind of brute forcing uh, potentially brute forcing um, a session right. and so the way that we kind of start down that road is by gathering a large sample of tokens like mm -hmm. so with burp sequencer that's where it really comes in handy is being able to generate these large sample sets um, once we have a large sample set well we can kick off um, the analysis portion mm -hmm. of it um, there's different ways you can look at analysis as well um, you know whether it's characters or bit level um, but Burp does that great as well. And then from there, you could kind of look at the exploitability of those tokens, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to kind of outline um, some fundamental components of that session ID. And um, and then you can kind of look at it and determine whether or not um, it's exploitable, right? Because mm -hmm. if, the, if the, the bit entropy isn't as high, um, then... then um, we can move into just generating a bunch of random session IDs um, or even the key space to kind of right. control it. Right? And so like, as you mentioned, like, it's not like this is going to be something where we can target a specific user usually, um, but like for a larger application where you have a lot of users logging in all the time, that generates a ton of different session IDs. And if they're not random and we can just start brute forcing, uh, we might be able to just land on a random account. Right. And have access to their, their yeah account. absolutely and, and and I guess this is where it comes to like um, the session timeout is really important because right. if you don't have a session timeout you're gonna have a lot of lingering sites and so if you think mm -hmm. about it from the perspective of if you have like a 64 bit session ID right mm -hmm. or or eight bytes um, as a session ID it's it's trivial um, to do that especially if you get a really large site that might have you know a thousand or ten thousand mm -hmm. um, active users. You're, the likelihood of you being able to predict a valid session is, is minutes. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you, if you up the, if you up it to 128 bits and have a higher, um, have 64 bits of entropy, um, you know it becomes years, like hundreds of right. years, to be able to predict um, a session. And so that's why session time notes are really, really critical um, and important. So, okay. So from there, I think you know we should probably jump into like kind of the burp sequencer and. and uh, um, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what I have here is a site that I threw up that generates like a fake session token. Um, normally what you would do is you would pass your credentials to the web server. The web server would issue you a token and then you would be doing the analysis on that. In this case, I'm just generating... You're simulating it. Yeah, I'm just simulating session tokens. One's 8 bytes, one's 16 bytes. We're going to look at the 8 byte one today. And um, and so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to send this, um, this URI to the sequencer. Sequencer is going to... Um, load it. We're going to do a live capture, but before we do that, we're going to want to create a custom location of where we're extracting the token. This is basically telling Burp, hey, here's my session token, um, and that's what it's going to do the analysis on. Um, I set it to 20 threads because I want to go ahead and get it done quicker. And then I also check the base64 decode because as you can see, the token that I'm generating randomly, I'm also doing a base64 encoding before I put it to the screen. So from here, we're going to go ahead and just do a start the live capture. It's going to go through, it's going to start generating all the tokens. And, um, and then once it gets to a certain threshold, we're going to stop at around 20,000, which is going to take a little bit. Um, but then we'll go ahead and move forward with uh, the analysis um, okay. while we have a good sample. Yeah, we can cut the vid for uh, a little bit and we'll, we'll, be, we'll see you at the end of the 20,000. <laughs> all right. Cool. 
part. All right, so we are at uh, 20,000 uh, tokens now. So we're kicking off the, the analyze now. Um, this is going to go through and do all of the analysis. Um, real quick to point out, um, it does a character level analysis, which is basically looking at all of the characters and order and the frequency and the whole nine yards. And then the other side of it is, is it does a bit level analysis where it actually converts those characters into the bit sequence and then does an analysis on the individual bit analysis. Um, but really the, the thing that I wanted to focus on here is, um, is two main things. First is we want to make sure that um, the overall quality of the randomness is... Um, is reasonable or is good or is great. Excellent, I think is what it is. Mm -hmm. So under the overall result, you'll see here it says reasonable. Um, just below that also is the overall um, effective entropy that it was there at 39 bits, which is bad, right? So you wanna get it um, 64 bits or higher um, because anything below 64 bits is gonna be easier to predict a session. Um, and that's bits of entropy, not um, bits because 128 bits is 64 bits of entropy, just to be clear. Um, so you want to make sure that your session IDs are 128 bits or at least 16 bytes. Um, and then down here, we also want to look at the reliability of our data sample set. Um, in this case, we had 20,000, um, and this is FIPS compliant. So once you get past a certain threshold of how many different samples that you're doing analysis on, um, you can become um, more confident in the results that you have here. And so here, we see the token length is 8, which is obviously... Um, 64 bits um, and, and that's low entropy. So that's kind of what we have here. Um, but those are the main focus areas on this the screen. Um, I mean, you could dig into some of the other components, um, the significance levels of the character levels and of the bits, but that's that's for another uh, another show. And we'll talk about maybe uh, actually exploiting them in another episode too. Maybe running right. through like how we actually go about. Uh, uh, the process of uh, brute forcing the, the tokens itself yeah. and maybe in another episode, but. Absolutely, cool. Awesome stuff, man. So uh, to wrap it up, um, so for, for blue teams, like for the developers that are actually doing this stuff, like what, what can they do to actually secure their session tokens or make sure they're not, you know, creating things with low entropy? Okay, cool. So one of the first things that you're going to really want to focus on is make sure that your session tokens are at least 128 bits. Right, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that. Um, but how, how do they do that? Is that like, a, like I just, you know, set that in like, a, I don't know, the code that I'm, I'm, I'm writing the, the web yeah, app Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you think 128 bits, you get 16 bytes. So mm -hmm. as long as your session ID is, is 16 bytes or more, um, then it should be a, a fairly strong, as long as it was generated in a good random way. Um, a lot of times these session management frameworks will have a really good way of generating session tokens. Gotcha. So, so I don't have to worry about like coding myself. Just no. make sure the, the management framework right. that That'd I'm be trusting that. is... Correct. Yeah. Is, is doing it correctly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and sometimes it's not, right? So right. you got to make sure that there's no like known CVEs or anything for the framework itself because sometimes you'll see that they have a known CVE for generating you know weak session IDs. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, that was my second one was as was basically not to roll your own session management framework. Right. <laughs> um, and then if you if you get you know you want to dig into it a little bit more and in your in your concern with it, um, check out the additional resources you know um, on the awesome that we have here. Yeah, yeah, there's a few blog posts um, that will be on there, and we've got uh, a, a link from the OWASP uh, site. And I'll, I'll include some more in the links below. Make sure you follow uh, Mike on Twitter. He is you stay ready on Twitter. I'm Daftac on Twitter. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, see you next week. Cool.